Yeah. Okay, welcome everybody to the second installment of the Coffee Microcaps uh, Fund Manager interview series where we talk to one of the microcap managers you'll see in our quarterly performance review report. Um, this time I'm delighted to be joined by Harley Rosser from the Capital H Inception Fund. Uh, Harley, we've got two very interesting stocks to talk about. Um, but first, uh, give us an overview of yourself uh, and your fund and a, a bit more kind of a philosophy on the kind of names you're trying to find. Sure. Thanks for reminding me on the, um, on the interview series. Um, so Capital H Inception Fund was set up June 2018. Um, we have a very open mandate. We can invest anywhere, but it's micro and small cap stocks that are our specialty. Um, and we just sort of dig across the whole market. We're industry agnostic. There's a range of different businesses in there from online, um, you know, online tutoring, digital businesses, domain names, advertising, alcohol. Uh, we've had some resources in there. So we brought on analysts, Josh, in February. So we've had a few, few wins there, which has been good. Um, but we scale the whole market. We're looking for good businesses um, with incentivized management. And when we find them, we try to back them as heavily as we can. Um, and if we can add value to those stories, then that's even better. Um, that's basically an overview of, of what we do. Um, returns have been decent since we started. So we're sort of annualizing at 25% um, after fees per annum. But you know, we're two and a half years in, so there's a long way to go to kick all of our goals. Okay, great. And uh, we've got two interesting ones. The first one is, um, which one we kick off with? Let's kick off with uh, Web Central, because um, it might take us a little bit longer. Um, but give us an idea, you know, what they do, um, how they make their money. Uh, and I think this one, maybe we might need to just give a little bit of backstory just to get up to where we are present day with it. Yep, sure. So basically what Web Central do, the business that's there now is they sell domain names, they sell hosting, and they sell uh, online marketing to small and medium enterprises in Australia and New Zealand. So Web Central used to be called Art Group, and then prior to that, it was called Melbourne IT. And Melbourne IT sort of founded the .com.au business in Australia. They grew rapidly when that was sort of, you know, the new, new it thing. And then I guess they did that sort of quite common story of trying to maintain growth by acquiring and taking on debt. And it was a good business. It was you know, generating lots of cash flow, but that doesn't work forever. Um, eventually they had to get to a point where they uh, had too much debt and overpaid for things and had to go through a rationalization process. So they started divesting businesses, they changed their name. Um, fast forward a long way, because it's a long story, but what they were left with was this web central business, which is the core domain hosting um, and SEO, online marketing, sort of website design to small and medium businesses in Australia. So they've still got a decent chunk of the market there. It's probably 20, 25% of, the, of that market share in .com.au in Australia, um, doing sort of 50 mil revenues of domains, um, hosting that core sort of stable um, source of revenue. Um, basically to sort of give you uh, why we got involved, the, that we're in the middle of sort of a bidding war between two um, acquirers. One was 5G Networks, which is Australian-based, listed in the ASX. Another one was Web.com. Um, Web.com is backed by a large private equity firm in, in New York. Um, we basically, to summarise the thesis, we got involved because we thought the stock was very cheap. Um, and along with, <coughs> became the second largest shareholder, bought, bought a bunch of stock. Along with a lot, another large shareholder, um, we basically decided to, to not accept the offer, the prevailing offer that the, the directors eventually accepted, um, and keep it listed. So. It's now listed with five networks owning circa 57%. Um, and the basic reason of why we did that is because we think the stock was too cheap. The offer undervalued the business. And this way, if it all pans out as we, as we think, um, shareholders of WCG will be able to benefit from the turnaround rather than it all being owned by one acquirer. Okay, great. So, yeah, I think maybe let's go into, okay, I guess, the, the investment thesis going forward. Um, I mean, do you see, is the play here, you still think there's growth in the business um, and, and, you know, what moving forward or are you kind of trying to force the hand of a 5GN to kind of basically pay up to what you think is the, is the valuation or, or is it a combination of, of all of that? It's a bit of a combination. I, I don't think, um, you know, I don't think it's, it's not just a play where we make 5GN by the rest of it or web.com to come back with a higher offer. I think, there's two phases. One is the, the cost out. So this was a company that used to be three, $400 million market cap. 
and the cost base has never really been adjusted to reflect what the business is now. And that's not necessarily all the board's fault. They were in a position where they were in bad bank with their, with their, with their bank and all the costs, all the cash was getting swept out and you couldn't really spend any dollars to save dollars at the time. So in a new vehicle of what they have now with a new board, I think the market's going to be surprised by how much cost they can pull out. So I think there's probably 10 to $15 million of annualized costs that they can just strip out of the business and we can run through numbers later, but that's sort of my view on that. In terms of growth, there's probably two parts to it. So they've got the domain name and the hosting business, which is the stable recurring sort of higher quality stuff. And my understanding is that's actually grown through COVID. So people were at home, they set up a business, they set up a website, and the domain market is actually, I think it's sort of 20, 30% growth through that period, which previously was quite a mature, very stable growing market. Um, so I think there's growth there, but I think that's been masked by their online marketing SEO business called WME, just sort of getting smashed and sort of going into hibernation. Um, whether or not the WME's, WME business is core moving forward is probably something that's still up for discussion. But that core domain and hosting business, I think, is a, is a good business. And I think it will steadily grow. And um, I think COVID, if anything, only sort of accelerates that. So from the perspective of, of 5GN, you've got, a, you've got a large controlling shareholder now that we know from past experience knows how to turn businesses around. So I'm very confident they'll hit all their cost out opportunity. And I think with that cost out, you can get the business to 10, maybe 15 mil of EBITDA per annum. And that alone gets you a higher share price. And then the second phase will be, can they grow it? And that's, you know, still up for, um, you know, Drew's out on that one still, but it's a 12 month later sort of story. So if you fix that, you get the cost out, it's generating good cash flow like it used to in its sort of heyday. Um, you can get debt under control. Um, you can start acquiring. There's probably a few little small businesses they can bolt onto there. Um, and that'll be the next kicker if they can get that higher multiple on the minority shareholding. One, one really key thing that happened um, very recently that I think is, is really important is often with these sort of situations where you get a large bidder that um, ends up with less than 100%, that bidder becomes incentivized to keep the share price low and the minority shareholders never get full value reflected in their shareholding. So we're second large, but we're a minority because currently 5G and control it and they have the guys on the board. Um, so that can be an issue and you never really get a full market multiple on the minority shareholding. What happened last week was that the, the new directors from 5GN um, are doing a capital raise through WCG and they're going to put in, I think it's about $3 million of their own money, PA. So you get this incentive shift from potentially a very large holder and controlling shareholder wanting the stock maybe to be low so they can mop up the rest to um, them putting in their own money and there's no reason why they're not going to want the share price as high as possible over time. I think the reason they can do that is what 5GN wanted was that 300,000 small medium business in Australia to cross sell to. And that's what web.com wanted as well, but that's the asset that's really valuable. So that's, that's one piece they wanted. And the second piece is 5GN have um, data centers all over Australia and most of them aren't utilized. And web, web central is a, is a domain hosting business. So they spend a large amount of their customers spend a large amount every year on, um, on hosting services. So 5GN just needed control so they can access the cross selling to the customer base. And then they needed to shift all that spend, which won't happen straight away, but it'll happen over time, um, into their own data centers. And there's probably 300 grand a month of spend um, and no extra cost to WCG because it's got to be at arm's length. It's got to be fair, but it gets shifted into 5GN. So you've got this situation that's kind of rare where the, 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 the company that tried to bid for all of it um, had to go in, recognizing they might not get all of it because there was a blocking shareholder in Keybridge Capital who's known for sort of um, you know, playing that corporate game well, um, but they got what they wanted out of it. And now that's incentives are aligned with the minorities. And I think we should be able to just enjoy them turning the business around. Um, and if they do, the stock will, this should read out a fair bit further. Okay. And, and 5GN, as you say, are probably in control of the board now. Have 5GN brought in uh, a new CEO to, to run Web Central? Or uh, I guess who's taking charge of? Yeah. Um, the business moving forward from here on a day-to-day -day operations basis. Yeah, so 5GN have um, put three of their um, people on the board and 5GN director and largest shareholder in Joe Mace is now the managing director of Web Central. Um, and it'd be worth reading that they put out an EGM, notice of EGM, I think it's last week with the raise, 
So obviously then they need shareholders to approve that share issue. We're the second largest shareholder and we intend to help vote that through because we think it aligns. I think it's good for the share price and that's probably why the stock's starting to go up. Um, but the, the, so the managing director of both companies now won't be paid a salary and he'll get options at 20 cents or performance rights for the next size price of 20 cents on hitting $10 million of annual EBITDA in WCG. So that becomes sort of, you know, it's not guidance, but you're not going to put that target out there unless you think it's reasonable. Um, I think they can hit that within probably 12, 18 months just from cost out. Um, so yeah, I think, and that's another thing, I think they've done this right, they've done this well in terms of aligning those incentives, not paying a salary, um, fairly lofty targets to get to. If you get there, then, you know, take your performance rights and we should all be happy. So um, yeah. So they've set the bar at a, at a reasonably high level. It's not a, it's not a, um, I would say not too low. It's like, but a, you know, it's not wildly optimistic either. Um, in terms of, I guess, key announcements then that I guess people should look out for over the next, uh, let's say, three to six months. Obviously, the the raise and the and the EGM to to get that through, and then. Uh, just refresh my memory, are they Appendix 4C reporting or the standard six monthly? It, it should just be the standard six monthly. Um, but yeah, the, the analysis to look out for will be the EGM. So if those shares get voted through, which I believe they will, but you, you know, you never know to them, we'll vote in favour and hope that they do. I think it'll be good for the stock price. Um, and then it's just all about execution. It's how, how quickly they can turn the business around. Um, Far GM presented at Wilson's conference last week or the week before and basically ran through numbers and it was pretty clear that the digital marketing business is the big loss maker. So if they can fix that business or they can sell it or they can close or whatever they decide to do with that, I think that's sort of like an overnight, very creative to EBITDA. So some sort of news on what they do with WME would be key to look out for. Um, but then it's just execution. So just keep an eye out for announcements on how quickly they can pull costs out. WCG have a bunch of sort of leases over office space not being used. Um, you know, maybe they can sublease some of that, or maybe you have to wait until they all expire. But they're all sort of potential little catalysts. I think the overarching thesis there is that I think the numbers they put out of synergies between, I think it was sort of three mil and seven mil of costs out that 5GN was quoting in their um, um, takeover offer and their presentation to raise capital. I think that's going to look conservative. Um, that's probably the minimum number they can get out. And it's probably just because they didn't want to attract another bidder over the top. But I think this will be a situation where you have a business that's been run as a three, $400 million market cap company. Um, and there's just going to be a lots of low hanging fruit to cut costs out. So that'll be the first basic stock up. Then the question is, can they grow it? I don't know yet, but if they get the costs out, I think we'll have a higher share price. So. Um, we'll just quickly move on to our second company now, Mosho, another one that went through a name change. It's a theme in your stock picks. Um, so Mosho, the old XTD, you know, give us an overview of exactly what the business does. Uh, how do these guys make their money? Yep, so Mosho, that name comes from promotion. Um, so people in motion and advertisement to those people. So um, Mosho is a place-based media business. Um, so as an example, one of their divisions is called Mercio Health. If you go into a, a Helios medical center and you're in the, the patient visitor room um, and those screens that are either sending communications to you about COVID warnings and COVID restrictions or, or advertisements, that's, that's Mercio's core business. Um, they have the same concept in uh, called Mercio Play in indoor leisure centers. So soccer, indoor soccer, netball, cricket, things like that. Um, and there's basically sort of four pillars to their business model. So the MD, Adam calls it the, uh, their circumflex. And it works similar to the concept of Amazon's flywheel. So you've got media ownership, which is actually owning those screens and operating those screens and um, in those centers. Um, you've got media or sales representation, which is selling that advertising space to, um, to, to, to an audience, to, to buyers um, on behalf of other media owners so they do that for another network large network in medical centers that has a thousand or, or 1500 screens um the next one is the content so actually producing the you know creative content that goes on those screens and then the last one is sort of ad tech and sport tech which i think will start to make a lot more sense over 2021 as they build a bit of scale 
um, in uh, across their business. So they were the old XTD. That was the cross track assets sort of in the train stations in um, in Melbourne. You you know the train approaches and there's an advertisement and, a, and it stops. And that's sort of been a good um, I guess revenue generator, but it's not poor. So. I think there's opportunities there to maybe extend some contracts or to you know to, to not have a drop off in revenue there, but it's not going to be the core of their business. And the exciting stuff is is the stuff I just told you about there. So um, we basically got in that into this company. Uh, we viewed it as backing a high quality management team in an industry, being outdoor media, place based media that had been smashed by COVID. Um, we bought twenty percent of the company through a placement primarily. They're well funded. It's a fourteen million dollar market cap. $4 million of cash. So they can, there's a bunch of acquisitions they're looking at. Um, but I think organic growth is what's going to surprise the market there because they have competitive advantages in each of those little niches I, I, I talked about. Um, and they've given guidance to AGM of being cash flow positive operationally. So um, that's the overview of the thesis there. And it's probably one of the more exciting or most exciting sort of stocks in the, in the fund I've had to pick one. Okay. And I guess if, if we just flip the coin the other side, I guess some of the risks ahead of them is it, you know, brands pulling back on on media spend just, uh, you know, e- even in a post-COVID environment, just because, you know, budgets are being slashed and, you know, they're trying to kind of maintain profitability. It's like a, a linger from COVID, even though even if we, you mentioned Melbourne, if we talk about Victoria, you know, the lockdown is over, but, you know, it's going to take brands a while to ramp up to previous media spend. Is that one of the key risks or... or you know what, what? What are things to kind of watch out for on the negative side? Yeah, I mean the, the the pace of the recovery out of COVID is is a risk, but it's also inverse in opportunity. So we intentionally made this investment at what we view as close to the bottom of that market. So and 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 outdoor media has been smashed. There was an article in the AFR that O Media was, you know, doing sales of ninety five percent off some of their big billboards, but. But most shows niches haven't been hit as hard because medical centers have still been operating um, and leisure centers have bounced back really quickly because people want to be active and they want to see their friends. So that is a risk of, of how quickly brands spend money again. But the inverse is that a big part of their strategy is acquisitions. And we've now, you know, they've, they've got the cash to go after a bunch of um, potential lemonade targets that are also struggling. There's others in the industry that are for, for sure struggling a lot more than, than Mojo did. And Mojo, I think, have come out and are now recovering. So that'll give them an opportunity to actually buy good businesses or good assets, like they bought with the Helios asset, um, at prices that look really, really cheap in hindsight. So, yeah, I mean, the main risk is just execution. This is a, a micro cap stock. Um, we've sort of gone in on what we think is the bottom. There's a lot of a lot to like about the business model. You know, uh, Mojo Health is sort of organic and acquisitive growth. Most of play is purely organic. It's a market that's sort of defining by themselves. It's owned by private centers over there that they can offer really valuable services to. And then the sport tech and ad tech stuff is, is what will get the market really excited when that strategy starts to, to play out. Um, but you've got, to, you've got to back the people that are executing on it. So Adam and MJ there have worked together for, for a long time. You know, we wouldn't have made the investment that we did unless we had complete confidence in them achieving, but you know, they've got to go out and do it. So it's just an execution risk um from here okay. and uh is it a, a fully australia only play or is there a bit of an international angle to it uh so there's it's fully international currently but i think over time um you know they, they made it pretty clear at the agm that their vision is to be the global leader in that place based space so I think if you look at it, if you take a really big picture, you know, I think what, what they've got now, they can get the stock to sort of 20 cents, which is a $40 million market cap, producing good cash flows and sort of dominate those niches of health and play. Um, probably within 12, 18 months, I think that organic growth is going to be really strong there and they'll get a few deals done. Once you scale up to $40 million, then you have the, the ability to do more creative acquisitions and start to become a major player in that space. And I think once they get to that point, um, I think that's when they'll start to look to to go global. So at the moment, it's not, you're certainly not paying for any of that because it's only $40 million market cap. But I think you'll find if they, you know, kick their initial goals and, and do what they're trying to do, uh, maybe 12, 18 months, there, there'll be some news around a, a global expansion for them because it's certainly part of their vision. And key announcements coming up. I mean, what, what are you looking out for? Are you looking out for one or two small acquisitions or, uh, or is it more a, a, a growth that growth 
vertical uh, of uh, ad tech and sport tech, like how quickly that can become a, I guess, a major contributor to the group. And obviously play, I think will be a, um, probably you know, you've got to win individual centers as you go. So the new side might not be as strong, but the organic growth in the half year and annual reports, I think will be a, will be a catalyst. Um, I think there's opportunity in a good way for their um, legacy cross track contracts. So how they sort of work to maybe extend and um, you know, get value out of that while it's still there. It's not going to, like I said, it's not the it's not the focus moving forward, but it'll be a, a revenue generator and a cash possibly a cash flow positive contributor in the short term. Um, and then from there, I think once you get to twenty twenty one, the sport tech ad tech starts to make a whole lot more sense. So they put in their AGM address a reference to um, their client base in the software they sell to indoor centers called Sports. Um, those clients alone are generating $60 million of revenue per year. Um, and that's a that's an opportunity to capture that through various different payment products, technology, software, um, in addition to the core of owning media and selling media into their, those screens. Um, so I don't think that's been uh, completely addressed and explained to the market yet, um, because I think they still have work to do to get there. But when that starts to make sense, um, that's share of that $60 million revenue is, is sort of up for grabs and there'll be more centers that they win over time. So that will grow. So this, I think there'll be quite a bit of news flow um, over the next 12 months. So sort of looking forward to how that all plays out. Yeah, great. Harley, listen, thank you very much for joining us on the, on this uh, a new series of uh, the, the microcap fund manager interviews. If anybody wants to get in touch with you um, about the stocks we've talked to today, or uh, about the fund, uh, what's well, what's the best way to get in touch? Just send me an email. So it's harley at capitalhmanagement.com.au. Um, we did info on the website too. So just capitalhmanagement.com.au. Um, always happy to chat. So feel free to reach out and appreciate your time, Mark. Okay, great. Glad to see you're on brand air, supporting webcentral.com.au uh, <laughs> email address and uh, with <laughs> the hosting. Yeah, yeah, got to support them. Uh, Okay.